I do not have any uh, financial relationship with might be associated with this lectures, and you just heard that colorectal cancer is preventable. Is preventable? It's over by early detections, chemo preventions, and lifestyle modifications. Lifestyle modification is not so easy. And when we speak about physical activity, we do not mean this. Also, to have, we just heard about positive fecal or cal blood tests, or even feet. It's not easy. People do not like to mess with their feces, and I guess it was a positive test. Also about capsule endoscopy. This is what my children suggested to me, but we're still not there. We just have sent a capsule, we'll find the polyp and take it out. And I do agree with uh, Rick Boland. Colonoscopy is the best screening modality to prevent colorectal cancer, but we do have to measure that the public is voting with his legs against screening colonoscopy. So lifestyle modification is not easy to achieve. We still have many problems with screening for colorectal cancer screening. I absolutely agree that the blood test is going to be the ultimate uh, solutions, but we are still not there. So we were left with chemo prevention. And this is taking out from a review that I've written uh, five years ago. And at that time, in 70 out of 72 uh, cases or articles, the, it was clearly demonstrating that NSAIDs and aspirin can prevent adenoma formations, reduce the incidence and mortality from colorectal cancer. And I would like to concentrate that in my talk about aspirin, it was first launched more than two centuries ago in 1897. And what you, I would like to draw your attention to what it says here, uh, aspirin does not affect the hearts. Well, we do not always have to believe the drug companies. And so it was shown that aspirin can reduce the incidence of and the mortality from uh, colon cancer. And again, here in 19 out of uh, 21 studies, it was demonstrated, so clear evidence. And I'm going to show you the, the real evidence for each one of them. Aspirin reduced the risk of recurrent colorectal adenoma, and there was five good studies that showed it. We can see it here, all of them clearly demonstrated that aspirin can reduce adenoma formations. Aspirin can reduce the colorectal cancer risk. This was a pooled data from the British doctor trial and the UK TIA trial, and they showed that regular use of aspirin around for, with 300 milligrams can reduce the risk in 26% and can reduce in 37% if it was taken for more than five years, and usually the benefit was seen after 10 years, and I, I will come back to it. This is a study that was, the result was given by Andrew Chur, Chan. He summarized the data from the Nurses' Health Study, which included more than 100,000 patients, and the one from Health Professionals' follow-up study, 50,000 patients. Altogether, they had 1,279 colorectal, uh, uh, colorectal cancer cases, and this is the data. We can see that aspirin reduced the mortality from colon cancer, but it also reduced the mortality of overall survival. So aspirin is effective. And I think this is an important question it's about overall mortality, and I'm going to address it at the end of my talk. Uh, here we can see that the effect of aspirin on long-term risk of colorectal cancer mortality. Again, the proven efficacy is seen all, all the way. And just we heard about early this morning about patients with high risk, patients with HNPCC. This was a landmark study of the John Brown that was published in The Lancet a year and a half ago. And we can see that aspirin, high dose, 600 milligrams, given for one to four years, was associated with a reduced risk of almost 40% in, in, in colorectal cancer, as well as other HNPCC mortalities. And I was also the reviewer for his 
next study, the CAP3 study that is on its way, and I spoken with John just last month in Berlin, and actually anyone who would like to join this study is welcome to do it, and you know, can send it to John, and we'll be happy to include more, more, more sites. Having said that, we do have, we, we, do, we do know that aspirin has some GI side effects. This, you no, know, we don't have to tell you, there are many of them, including some nuisance symptoms, mucosal lesions, as well as serious GI complications. This is another study, the data that coming from the Chan study, and this is a dose of aspirin and risk of GI bleeding, and we see that it's a dose dependent. And we can, and based on that, the United States Preventive Services Task Force in 2007 recommend against routine use of aspirin or NSAIDs to prevent colorectal cancer in average risk in individuals, and they say that harm outweighed the benefit for the prevention of colorectal cancer. And, uh, you know, I, I agree. You know, whenever we tell we want to give something to our patients, this is a benefit, this is a risk, we would like to be here 100% efficacy, 0% toxicity, usually does not exist and depends on the risk of the disease. We would like to be somewhere here in the acceptable balance, this is usually the restricted zone, and in patients like, you know, high risk for colon cancer like HNPCC, we would be willing to accept some kind of toxicity. And I think when I'm going to show you that when we speak about aspirin with a 20 to 70 percent efficacy and quite low toxicity, we are happy to use it as, as a chemo-preventive agent. And I also agree that one should take no risk, no doubts about it. And we should careful, and this is coming to the personal uh, aspirin uh, theory, that aspirin is effective only if it takes once every day. You can see it here, if people taking aspirin uh, six to 14 times, six to 14 tablets per week, once a day, then it is effective. Aspirin is affected only after a decade of use, so we have to take it for a long time. No use to take it for a short time. Aspirin decreases the long term of proximal cancer. As we can see here, it's less effective in the distal cancer. And this might tell me, this is not the topic of my, my, my lectures, but maybe aspirin should be combined with screening colonoscopy. We have heard that screening colonoscopy is good for the distal part, Aspirin is good for the proximal part. Maybe we should combine the two. Aspirin is effective only in adenomas that express COX-2. So when we have an adenoma, we should look for the expressions of COX-2, and we should give aspirin only to those who express COX-2. Aspirin is effective only if we have a wild-type BRAF tumors. This was a just a paper that is in press. It was uh, kindly given me by Andrew Cho. It was presented in Digestive Disease Week in, 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 in Orlando last month. And this is also, we look for COX-2, we should also look for BRAF, only, it's only in wild type it is effective. It is also effective, aspirin is effective only if the tumors have peak free mutations. And this is again, it was published a couple of months ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. So it shows that aspirin is not effective ever in, in all patients. It is also effective, and it's again by Andrew Chan, it was also presented, it was published two years ago in gastroenterology, that it's also is effective only if there is increase in plasma soluble TNF, thermal necrosis factor receptor. It is also about PGEM, again, only aspirin is effective, to prevent advanced adenoma only when there is high levels of this prostaglandin. So aspirin use, so w w what should we recommend? Do we have from the data that I've shown you, can you make any conclusions? So I think in high risk populations, patients with familial adenomatous polyposis, HNPCC, there is no doubt that aspirin should be, should be prescribed and most probably in high dose. What about patients with moderate risk, so those with a personal or family history of colorectal cancer with a lifetime risk of 10 
to 50%? I guess, yes, it has to be discussed in, with the patients, but in most cases, I would recommend it. And, but it's obviously, as I show, as I show you, it should be um, evaluated and should be judged depending on the profiles of the tumor, depending if it has expressing COX-2 or not, BRAF, etc. What about the general population? What should be the approach? Obviously, those with 1.2 million new cases a year, 30 to 50 percent incidence of adenoma, we should advocate for diet, exercise, tobacco advoisance, limitations of alcohol use, screening, and what about aspirin? So I think we should try to develop, to try with those at high risk for colon cancer. Smokers or ex-smokers, alcohol consumers, obese, sedentarians, those who consume red meat. And I also think that specific genetic profile is very important. Driver et al. tried to develop scores for increased risks for colorectal cancer. It was a very simple score, and I like simple scores. It's good for physicians. They used just age, smoking history, body mass index, and alcohol use. And based on this, he was able to, to tell us that those at the highest risk, those with a group with 9 to 10 points, had an odds ratio for having colon cancer that was 15 times higher than those at the lowest risk. <coughs> I'm trying to improve this course by adding some SNPs, some single nucleated polymorphism in the APC genes, the I1307K, everyone knows these Ashkenazi mutations, which increase the risk by 1.5 to 2. We also, also published in Annals of Oncology two years ago about a different polymorphism in the APC genes, E1317Q. In this, we found that the likelihood, the odds ratio is 4, but I strongly believe in combinations, and we just did a SNP, single nuclear polymorphism in the CD24 and the APC genes, and in those patients, the risk was seven times higher. So now we're trying to validate and trying to improve the rider scores and trying to have these scores so that we can tell the patients, look, you are very high risk for colon cancer. Maybe it's better for you to consider any kind of, any kind of prevention and also try to use aspirin. And we, we, we should speak about personal aspirin therapy, and I'm going to show you some data. But when a patient is coming to you or is coming to me and say, I would like to improve my health, he really does not care if I'm going to prevent colon cancer or I'm going to prevent cardiovascular disease or Alzheimer's disease. The three most important devastating disease that we were currently facing. He would like overall to live longer and better. So I think one of the big mistakes of all the trials that they are concentrating on colon cancer or cardiovascular or, or Alzheimer, but I think we should have the entire pictures. So this is what I think. If we have a patient with high risk for cardiovascular disease, according to the Framingham study, more than 20% of having an ischemic or, or a myocardial infarction in the next decade, he should receive aspirin, no doubt about it. Patient with high risk for colon cancer, FAP, HNPCC, again, no doubt, aspirin or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs should be prescribed. If a person has a high chance of having Alzheimer's disease, most probably he also should be put on aspirin. On the other hand, it's also, also easy. Low risk for cardiovascular disease, less than 10% according to the Framingham study, aspirin is not needed. Low risk for colorectal cancer, those with no symptoms, no family history, a negative colonoscopy should not be on, put on aspirin, as well as patients with low risk for Alzheimer's disease. What is really difficult is of moderate, moderate risk for ischemic heart disease. In these patients, the, should they receive aspirin? It is not known. If they are at low risk for colorectal cancer, low risk for Alzheimer's disease, I will speak it to discuss it with the patient, but most probably they do not need aspirin. If they are at medium risk for colorectal cancer, medium risk for Alzheimer's disease, again, I will discuss it with the patients, but yes, I, would, I tend to, to suggest or tell the patient, yeah, maybe the, the benefits will outweigh the risk. Obviously, if we are going to give aspirin, we have to take into consideration the locations, expressions, etc. 
What about those with medium risk for colorectal cancer and low risk for Alzheimer's disease or low risk for colorectal cancer and medium risk for Alzheimer's disease? Again, it's difficult to tell you. I would discuss it with the patient. It should be the decisions of the patients. Genetics is very important. And we have a paper now in pharmacogenomics genetics. It is impressive. It's a collaboration between my group and the group of Nelly Ulrich, used to be in, 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 in Seattle. Now she moves to the DKFZ in Germany. And we use the, out of the principal investigator with Bernard Levine in the PRESAP study. He published it in the New England Journal of Medicine. We took patients that we found adenoma. We randomized them to receive selecoxib or placebo. And after one year and three years, we did colonoscopy. And as we can see across the board, the preventive efficacy of selecoxib was shown due to some COX-2 cardiovascular toxicity, the likelihood and the possible of having COX-2 inhib inhibitors is, is out of the question nowadays. But we had, I had one in 120 patients from this study were at my site, and on this site we did some genetic analysis, some polymorphism. And and you can see that polymorphism that were associated with adenoma recurrence in the COX-2 genes was highly significant, as well as in the PGDH, postaglandidatrogenase. So I think based on that, on this polymorphism, I was able to tell the patient, what is your likelihood of having adenoma recurrence? And you can see it here, the wild type, the heterogeneous and the homozygous variant, and the Y axis is the probability of adenoma recurrence. This is for the COX-2 variant, <coughs> and this is for the PGDH variant. <coughs> and we can see that based on this, I can tell the patient if he's going to have or does not have to going to have <coughs> adenoma recurrence. Based on polymorphism in other genes, we were able to tell the patient <coughs> what is your likelihood of, of having cardiac toxicity. This in this, if somebody have polymorphism in the EGFR, uh, doesn't matter, on, it was on both treatment, is going to have and the placebo and the treatment hub is going to have toxicity, while those are going to have in the uh, PGS, polymorphism, look, could have eight times more or four times more if they are going to receive a COX-2 inhibitors. And so on, this is another polymorphism that we were able to predict if the patient is going or not going to have cardiac toxicity. And in this slide, we can see how we can predict, how we can predict the GI toxicity. And based on this, I would like to, 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 to sum up. There is strong evidence exists for a cancer-preventing effect of low-dose aspirin, particularly if taking every day for at least a decade, and most probably for the right column. Future benefit-risk balance should take all benefit and risk into account to provide optimum guidance. Ischemic heart disease, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease. In particular, benefit in cancer, uh, yes, okay. a genomic and neoplastic molecular signatures will predict efficacy and toxicity. There is no doubt that this is very important and based on the genetic profile of the tumor or the adenoma, as well as the germline genetic profile, will be able to tell our patients a lot. And I think this is definitely in order to, 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 con to conclude my lectures. An aspirin a day will help prevent a heart attack if you have it for lunch instead of a cheeseburger. Thank you very much. And I was able to be on time.